we have a few uh, organizers today I want to introduce. Uh, so let's start with uh, Michelle. Michelle, can you uh, introduce yourself? Oh, hi, thanks. Um, my name is Michelle Lee. I'm the Academic Program Manager at SCET. Great. And how about Melissa? Hi, I'm Melissa Glass, and I'm one of the managers of new initiatives over at SCT, working pretty closely with Iklak Sidhu, who is the founder of the Sutarja Center of Entrepreneurship and Technology. Happy to be here. Great. And Tamana, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Tamana. I'm currently the outreach manager at YC. I graduated from Berkeley last year, so really excited to be here with you all today. Okay, wonderful. Um, yeah, so our flow today is um, Michelle is going to give us a brief overview of uh, programs here at SCET. And then we have uh, YC President Jeff Ralston will be joining us in about 10 minutes. And then he's going to give about a 15 to 25 minute, depending kind of overview of uh, YC programs and give you guys more um, information about how you can get involved with their accelerator. And then we'll have the Q&A. And like I said, you can put questions in the chats for, for Jeff. Um, and we'll kind of see how it goes from there. Okay, so first let's kick it over to Michelle. Michelle, can you give us a, a little overview of SCET programs? Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully I do this right. Okay. All right, so just a little bit about SCET. Um, it is where aspiring entrepreneurs and innovators take deep dives into the world of technology, entrepreneurship, and innovation. We are housed within the Industrial Engineering and Operations Research Department, so we're within the College of Engineering. And we offer courses, both undergraduate and graduate, um, through the center. And we have a certificate as well, which I'm going to talk about today. We also have research opportunities for students um, in our X labs, and those are mostly right now in our alternative meat lab. So if you're interested in any of this, take a look at our website. Um, it is down here and there's a student section that you can uh, see all of this information. Okay, so normally we would have these types of events at our center, but unfortunately we can't do that right now. So I wanted to show you all some pictures of, um, this is uh, actually our center here, these bottom three, and these are at a couple of our events. So we have a lot of fun, we are a community, so we're happy that you're all here joining us today. And we hope that you continue to um, join us for some virtual events throughout the year. Okay, a little bit about our certificate. It's called the Certificate in Entrepreneurship and Technology. Um, I want to mention it's open to all majors, so you don't have to be an engineer or computer science student. Um, there's no application to start the certificate, but you do apply when you're completing the requirements. You also can overlap courses with your major and minor course of requirements, so keep that in mind. Um, there's also three possible tracks to complete the certificate. So there's the coursework track, there's the startup track, and the study abroad track. The coursework track is our most popular one where students will take our Newton lecture series, which is a one unit course, and then five additional units from our approved course list, so six units overall. And again, you can take a look at our website for all the details of that certificate and FAQs. And then this is just a list of our upcoming courses that we're offering in the fall. Um, and again, you can take a look at our website here for more information um, on all of them. And some of them, uh, well, I'm gonna go to the next page here. So all majors are welcome. Some of the seats are reserved for certain majors, so keep that in mind. Some classes also do require permission of the instructor. There's an application for a couple of our classes, and I think only one has recommended prerequisites, but um, in general, most of our classes are open to most students. And I do wanna note that for this upcoming fall, most of our classes will be taught remotely and will require participation during the posted class time. So um, just a note about that, and that should be updated in the class schedule now as well. So if you're interested in learning more about our certificate or our courses, take a look at our website. There are a lot of frequently asked questions on there, but if, um, if you have additional questions, you can certainly contact me, and my email address is put all over our website. And we do encourage you to stay in touch as well, so you can find out about more of these types of events. You can sign up for our newsletter, follow us on social media, um, and all of that information is in our website footer if you go to the website and scroll all the way down. Okay, and I think that is it. Great, thanks, Michelle. Um, does anyone have any quick questions for Michelle uh, before we move on? 
Okay, so I want to um, also mention that today is um, one of two events we are um, working on with um, YC. Uh, so today we're having some general information from uh, from Jeff, but um, but there's going to be a follow-up event where there will be actual office hours where you can get some time with uh, Jeff and YC and get specific questions answered. Uh, so Tamana, do you want to talk about that when the event is and how students can sign up? Yeah, sure. So I'm going to drop a link in the chat. Um, and basically, right after this event, sometime next week, if you guys sign up before the deadline, you have the chance to talk with Jeff. Um, either it will be group office hours or one on one. It depends on how many people we accept. And um, the link is in the chat. So feel free to it's a really short application. So feel free to sign up. Another link I'm going to post is something called work at a startup. We just recently um, started this program and it's basically an internship program for students who are enrolled in and want to figure out what it's like working at a startup. So I'm just going to quickly post that in the chat as well. And um, Jeff is going to be on in a couple of minutes, but before he's on, let's do a quick icebreaker. So if you are a technical student, um, why don't you just put T in a chat? And if you are more of a business student, why don't you just put B in a chat so we can get a sense of who's in the room right now? Great. I feel like it's a mix. Great, cool. Well, um, I think Jeff has arrived. I don't. I think I saw him come in, yeah, so maybe. Yeah, I think, I think he's probably setting up. Cool. Um, one more question. If you're building a startup right now, why don't you put up an S? And then if you are interested in startups, why don't you type in an I? Cool. What's a no? <laughs> Someone posted a no. No idea what a no is. Okay, Jeff is just connecting to sound, so we'll give him another minute. Oh, got it. Cool. So I think we have 50-50. Also, another question. Are you guys more interested in asking Jeff questions or hearing some of his crazy founder stories? So if you want to ask him, if you want more time for questions, why don't you put in a Q? And founder stories, you can just put in an F. Oh, cool. Founder stories it is. Great. Okay, let's see how we can get Jeff on. I think Jeff left, but he'll be back soon. I think he's having sound issues, but. Yeah, as always, thanks for bearing with us as we maneuver through the wild world of Zoom. So thank you. Well, since we're asking fun icebreaker questions, I'm curious, um, can everyone just put their major in the chat? That might be interesting. Also a mix. Cool. I have another question out of curiosity. If you're international, why don't you just post it in the chat? Well, we have one, oh, two. <laughs> More, more than two. That's great. Cool. I know we're waiting for Jeff, but this is kind of fun. Uh, maybe if we, we just keep going. <laughs> This is the entire session. <laughs> yeah, this is what we're doing the entire session. <laughs> I'm curious though, um, whether you're interested in startups or you have a startup already, um, what industry is your startup in? So is it like mobile or internet of things or AI or um, mm -hmm. maybe just put like what in industry you're interested in or working on? Cool. 
Cool. Very cool. I have another question. If you've applied to YC before, or you're planning to apply, just type in YC or something. Cool. This is actually really fun. I'm enjoying this. <laughs> Do you have a question, Stephen? No, I, I, I'm just enjoying watching everything that comes in and seeing the students. A lot of great data here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Stephen, do you want to plug your class? <laughs> uh, yeah, by the way, if anybody has taken um, one of our SCET classes, like a challenge lab or some of our other classes, and you're working on a startup, uh, we actually have an open enrollment. Uh, we're calling it the SCET Venture Lab, where we're going to walk through some um, different things to help you get your startup to the next level. Um, I know there were some folks from our sports tech and human performance class that were working on some pretty exciting things. And I know there's many of you who were in some of our other classes. So you can certainly check that out. It is one, Michelle, help me uh, with the, uh, the course number if you're interested. Yeah, it's um, industrial engineering and operations research, uh, 198. And the section is uh, 005. Yeah, it's a two unit course. We'll have a once a week uh, master class. And then every two weeks, myself and uh, possibly some other folks will be sitting down with you in a coaching session. Now, this is different than mentoring. This is actually startup coaching. This is some of the stuff that I do um, with startup founders and some executives and so forth out there. Um, so anyway, if anyone's interested, uh, we'd love to have you apply. There's an application uh, that you can find uh, online. I, I believe it's at SCET or um, I know there was an email that recently came out with some of our professors. So. Anyway, I don't want to take up too much time. You can find the link on our website. Perfect. Cool. I'll just answer a question that came up in the chat. YC doesn't have internships in general, but we do have the program that I mentioned earlier, work at a startup. Just posted the link in there. Um, so that's something you can check out if you're interested. And yeah, if there are any other general questions, just feel free to drop them in the chat at any given point. Maybe while we wait, Tamana, uh, can you talk about you know the application cycle at YC and kind of where we're at right now and how that's working? Yeah, of course. Um, so we actually had our first remote batch this past these past couple of months, which has been quite interesting, obviously because of COVID. Our next batch has already started um, accepting applications and. So a secret that I'll let you guys know is that we always, we never close applications. Um, obviously there's like a late deadline and on, on time, but it doesn't really affect your application at all. So feel free to apply at any given point during the year. The remote batch has been pretty interesting. Um, everything's been virtual, but it's been crazy to see how we've been able to accept a lot more, like the same amount of companies, but companies that usually wouldn't have participated in the batch have, for example, if they have family restrictions or legally, if they're not allowed to leave their country for some reason, there are a lot of companies that have actually chosen to join the batch because it's been remote. Um, and there is some sort of hybrid system that we might adopt in the future, but that's all very dependable because we still really believe that like the network of YC is in the Bay, but that's all changing. So. We'll keep you guys updated. Um, no, the remote batch does not require teams to move to the Bay. Everything's completely on Zoom. Um, Zoom's become our best friend. And we, we have a lot of different portfolio companies that we've been incorporating, such as Donut. Um, Donut is like an app where you randomly get introduced to another coworker or colleagues. So we're just trying to incorporate different systems, but nothing, um, in person, obviously, because of what's going on right now. Tamana, what about um, something I'm always curious about with YC is what stage should a startup be at to like have the best chance of being accepted? So we accept all stages. So you could have raised a series A and been accepted to the batch, or you could have just had an idea with literally a PowerPoint deck, which is completely bare. The thing that we care about most is the progress 
So if you say you've been working on your company for two months, but you've been able to get 10 paying customers within two months, that's more impressive than if you've been working on your company for a year or two and there's no real paying customer or there's no data that's showing that people really care about what you're solving. So I think any stage, the stage doesn't really matter. I think what what's really important to keep in mind is how fast you've progressed within the amount of time you've been given. What percent, uh, so I'm just reading questions in the chat. Also, I don't know what's going on with Jeff, but I think he's just trying to get on Zoom. So bear with me. Um, you have me instead of Jeff for a little bit longer. But uh, what percent of YC's past cohort companies have been led by founders still in college, recently graduated from school? So I do know that the youngest person we have funded was 15 years old. And um, I would say it's about 15 to 20% of founders are um, recent grads or still in school or have dropped out to pursue their idea. So um, students are actually a pretty big part of the application pool and people we accept. Cool. We're just gonna, I'm, I'm gonna check in on Jeff. Oh, I think he's in the waiting room. I've just admitted him. So he is, working. yeah, he's, he's somewhere here. I, he's in. <laughs> I know, which, which page? <laughs> I have no idea. Oh, I see him. Hey, Jeff, how's it going? Good, hi, everyone. Sorry <laughs> about that. Man, well, computers can be annoying sometimes. Well, I'm glad you made it. So I'll just let you, I'll just hand it off to you. You can start. Okay. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? Maybe waves. Let's see if I can see everyone here. Um, this is weird, right? Okay. Well, good morning. Um, so uh, I guess I should welcome you to our, our 2020 virtual college tour. Um, so uh, I always really prefer to be in person on these, but I guess we can't do that now. So I'll, what I'm going to do is, is I'll talk for a while, but I'll also let's try as much as we can to make this interactive. So uh, I'll take questions as we go. I'll be looking in the chat. Um, I'd really like to have a conversation about entrepreneurship, uh, obviously from YC's perspective, but so feel free to write questions to interrupt, I, and I certainly don't mind. So maybe in that spirit, uh, I can start with a few questions. And um, let's see, let's try to do this in chat. So, um, so for example, uh, just, just type in yes or no to the following question. Uh, anyone here a software person, an engineer? Just type in yes. You can just do Y's or yes. It doesn't. Okay, fine. Okay, a lot of wow, a lot of software people. Um, have how many people here in this group of about ninety people plan on starting a startup? Just yes or no. Do any of you plan on starting a startup while you're still at school? Or are you gonna wait? Wow. Um, how many, how, who knows, okay, separate question. Who knows how many cases of COVID-19 we have in California right now? Anybody? Too many, that's the right answer. About 300,000, that's about right. Yeah, over 12, right? Okay, so I am going to run through some stuff. And again, let's make this interactive. Any questions you have, you can either just try to speak, just take yourself off. I, I don't know, I hope you can take yourself off. You probably can, or just send it in chat. I'm gonna share a presentation with you guys now. Oh, the way things have been going, I'm gonna try to share this presentation. Just 
Can everyone see that? Thumbs up? Yes. yes. Sweet. Yep, we can see it. Okay, so I thought, um, you guys have probably heard of YC, but I thought I'd give you a little context about YC to start, and then we'd maybe just talk about startups a bit. Um, just sort of where we, where we are, where we came from, and where we are today. So um, I thought it might be fun to take a little bit of a, of a trip back for, in time to um, where our story began. You guys are talking about starting your own startup and beginning your story, but YC began in 2005 when Paul Graham gave this talk, How to Start a Startup. It's also an essay, and maybe some of you have read it. It was a talk to the Harvard Computer Society. And um, interestingly, it just turned out that it was a turning point in the history of venture capital. Not unlike, you know, the venture capital kind of started almost 60 years ago when this guy named Eugene Dorio invested $70,000 in a company called Digital Equipment Corporation and made $35 million. You can, you can imagine why people wanted to chase after that and put money into startups like the ones you guys want to start. This was another turning point, but it was kind of a surprising one. It, it, it changed things dramatically, and, and I would claim permanently. Just after that talk, Paul, uh, you, you see here Paul with his, his girlfriend at the time, Jessica Livingston, later his wife, and his co-founders from an earlier startup, I'll talk more about that later, Trevor Blackwell and Robert Morris, they founded Y Combinator. Um, anyone know the original name of YC? Anybody? So that wasn't the original name of Y Combinator. I can't get to my chat in there. That's interesting. Anyone, anyone, anyone know? No one knows the, the initial, the original name. I don't want to guess. Okay, it was called the Summer Founders Program. Not a, not a great name. Um, they re anyone know where Y Combinator comes from? Where that name comes from? Anybody? Lambda Calculus. Wow, that's great. That's right. It's what, it, there's this, this, um, uh, the maybe you guys have studied it some of you but the lambda calculus is this this construct in computer science that's sort of an abstract way to describe languages and a y combinator is a function of functions get it we're a company of companies and so paul who has a phd in computer science liked that idea so um the summer of 2005 this was the first batch of yc um okay here's another question for you guys there was a billion dollar company in that batch. You can see them. Anyone know which one it was? Yeah, there's Sam Altman. Someone print, put, puts out Sam Altman. Sam Altman's company looped was not a billion dollar company, but Sam was the first president of YC. He took over after PG. Tantai's got it, Reddit. Airbnb was not in this batch actually. Airbnb was in 2009, but Reddit indeed, if you look, um, Jessica Livingston is on the left there. If you look right next to her is Steve Huffman, who's the current CEO of Reddit. And right behind Steve is Alexis Ohanian. Those two guys were the co-founders of Reddit. And they were in the very first batch of YC, which if you ever start investing in later in your careers and you get $1 billion companies out of eight companies you invest in, that's either incredibly lucky or incredibly good or probably some combination of the two. So YC started... 15 years ago with this summer of batch. <laughs> Michael's not now leading Reddit. Michael joined the board of Reddit. <laughs> but um, yeah, so Michael took Alexis's place on the board of Reddit. Yeah, and that's Justin there as well in the bottom. Yeah, there's some history there, right? So first batch was eight companies. Um, our um, last two batches have been over 200 companies. And Here's where we are in 2020. We've funded over 2,500 companies. We've funded over 5,000 founders. The, um, 
these companies have raised collectively over $32 billion, which is a pretty good chunk of change, I think. And the total market value, and market value means you know, not, not public market. We have two public companies, um, um, PagerDuty and Dropbox. But this is the market value that investors have given them is over $150 billion. It's actually well over that now. And here's just a kind of a cool view of the set of Epic companies so far that we've launched. There's, we usually count the, this billion dollar club of unicorns is over 20. Here's, here's the sort of an unusual way to look at it. I, we don't usually show this is over time as they were in, the, in given the batches um, that they were in. This number is actually about, I would say something like 50% understating the number of billion dollars companies we funded because there's a whole bunch of companies now that if they went out today would have billion dollar companies, companies like, like Zapier, your Benchling, you might've heard of a front companies that are certainly worth billions of dollars. So I thought I would transition to talk a little bit about a concept you guys are all working on. And maybe you think you know how to start a startup and this will be just sort of old hat to you, but it's actually sort of an interesting idea that, um, boy, back when I was thinking of entrepreneurship, I really didn't know where to begin. And there's sort of an, you know, Paul's, Paul's talk was something, was, was sort of transformative for the industry. He laid out really clearly three different parts to starting a startup. And I thought I'd go over, well, at least two of those parts. One of his parts was raising money and being cheap. And I'll talk about that later, but I have sort of three parts that I'd like to talk about is starting a startup. So uh, tell me, those of you who want to start a startup, how many, just yeses or noes, how many have an idea already of what they want to start? Yeah, someone said too many ideas. I love that, maybe. No, no. Does anyone want to start a startup but don't have, you don't have an idea yet? You all know what you want to start. Sometimes finding the idea is the hardest part, but um, I, I sort of like to think about ideas in sort of two parts, which is what's a good idea for a startup in abstract? And then what's a good idea for you as a startup? Um, and it is, it's actually, it's actually good still, yes, yeah, so, no, but investigating. Um, one of the things to keep in mind about the idea is that the best ideas for a startup, and uh, it's important to keep in mind that when we talk about a startup, we're talking about fast growth, venture, financeable companies, not, not and it's, it's easy to, to be confused about what that really means because there's lots of business startups, restaurants, other small businesses that, some people might term startups, and this is just purely a, a matter of terminology. For us, a startup is a company that a venture capitalist might be interested in putting money behind because they have the potential to grow really fast and to grow really large. So what are the ideas that have the characteristics that can do that? Um, what are ideas that, that uh, could potentially be natural monopolies that are in a market that's, that's large and growing that actually fix something that's really broken. Ideas don't have to be easy to explain necessarily, but you have to find a way to make them easy to explain. Otherwise, you'll have a hard time getting financing, getting people to join your company. Actually, even for yourself, you need it to be easy to explain because when it gets hard and it always gets hard, you need to get up in the morning and explain to yourself why you're doing what you're doing. And, and that's the second part of ideas that matter. Um, do an idea, like if you have your ideas, all you guys who have ideas, do it because you care about the idea, because you care about it so deeply that think about it, you're willing to commit to this until you're 30. Think about that. I actually just talked to an entrepreneur, a YC founder last night, who um, him and his co-founder founded their company while they were at Yale as undergraduates. By the time they graduated, they had half a million dollars in ARR, in annual recurring revenue. And then they did YC, and they're still at it. And this was in 2012, so it's been almost a decade. They're now in their 30s, and they're having 
all sorts of like, you know, existential questions. We've been working, they're doing great, but they've been working on it for almost 10 years. You better really care about what you're doing and believe in what you're doing if that's gonna be the case. Okay, how many of you have co-founders already? Think about how you find your co-founders. We, um, we do fund solo founders, but boy, startups are hard and doing them by yourself is, is harder. You typically want people you know, people who are good friends, people whom, with whom you can survive going to battle with, people who compliment you, people who, who get things done. That is a classic characteristic of great YC founders, or excuse me, of great startup founders is they will get things done. Uh, PG in his, in his article talked about finding people who are animals, people who just like are tenacious, they'll grip something, get a grip on something and not stop until it's, until it's fixed or taken care of or worked. So you want people who are builders, who are smart, determined, the kind of people you're gonna to wanna to work with for many, many years. Um, for PG's first company, he, he, he picked um, two kind of amazing people. Robert Morris, who, um, who is probably most famous for creating the first internet worm. You should, you should Google that and read that. He actually, he actually um, uh, had, to, had a run-in with the federal authorities over this worm. One of the smartest people you'll ever meet and is now a professor at MIT. And Trevor Blackwell, just another person who, you know, he built a robotics company on his own. The two amazing people. And, and if you get the right idea, their right idea back in the mid 1990s was to, to actually create the first SaaS company called ViaWeb, which was a, an online e-commerce company. And because they did it right, and because they executed on it, they all got rich doing it. They all got, the, the company got bought by Yahoo in 1998 for tens of millions of dollars. So that's the last thing I'll say is you think about the three things to think about, right? Your idea, your founders, and then making something people want. As some of you guys know, that's our motto, to actually execute. We, we talk about this in a really simplistic way. Um, we were built around software engineers. In fact, the original idea around YC was to put technologists at their center of value creation. So we have this saying, we say, write code and talk to users, which is just a simple way of saying, build things, talk to users, figure out whether the thing you built matches the value they're looking for, and then iterate and do it again and again and experiment and eventually find this almost mythical concept called product market fit, which really is a way of saying that the thing you built matches the value that users are looking for. And when you find product market fit, you'll find you can't help but grow. So this is a question that I always like to ask next. And um, it kind of begs the question here. This is, I think, the entrepreneurship group at Berkeley. So you all don't maybe need to ask yourself this question, um, but I actually think it's kind of important. Uh, right out of school, what I did is I joined HP. I got a pretty cush job working for the man. And you know that's actually pretty comfortable and a pretty good thing to do. Why, tell me guys, why are you starting a startup? Why would you start a startup? What's the reason to do it? Why? Improve the quality of life. Who's yours or everyone else's? Value creation. Can't work for other people. These are good reasons. To help the world while doing something I love. I think I like that the best. Um, PG wrote this great essay about doing something you love. <clears throat> and you know, I think we should all take it to heart. I think the, the, the best reason to start a startup is, is, um, is sometimes missed, which is, yeah, these are great reasons, respect, to feel comfortable dedicating your all, 
because you cannot not. That's, that's, I, I think because you cannot not is maybe my favorite because you have to do it. In fact, sometimes when people tell me, I don't actually, can you guys just type in a, um, a code for what year you are at, at, at Berkeley? F for freshman, um, S for sophomore, J for junior, X for senior, and P for postgraduate, if anyone. So sometimes people ask me, like, should I, should I drop out of school to, to start a startup? And I usually say, no, you should finish school. It's worth it. Finish school unless you can't not do your startup. Every once in a while, you'll be able to do what those guys I, I, I described did and start your startup while you're at school. But mostly, you're, it's kind of binary. Either you're doing it or you're not. And if you have to do your startup, if your startup is grabbing you and drawing you out, then maybe you don't finish school. There's so many paths here to how you start your startup. Um, man, I, I started my startup 10 years after I left school, which is too long for me. But um, some people start their startup in school. Some people, you know, there's, there's plenty of famous stories of people who started their, their startup while in school and, and never went back. Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, um, even people in graduate school, they finished undergrad, but Sergey and Larry at Google and, and Jerry and David at Yahoo left graduate school to start their startups because they couldn't, they couldn't not. So let's assume, okay, for the sake of argument, you've decided to start your startup, which many of you have. I thought I'd give you guys a little more insight into how YC works. Um, some of you may feel like you know about that pretty well. I will go pretty rapidly through this stuff, but I think it's helpful to put in context. And we've changed a lot over time too. So <clears throat> I'll go into some of the ways that we have changed and, and why we might be a, um, a part of whatever journey you guys are taking on your startup. So we run, we, we look a little bit like a, a postgraduate, very short postgraduate school for startups. <clears throat> Excuse me, we run twice a year. We have a winter batch and a summer batch. The summer batch is in session now. It runs from June to August. The winter batch runs from January to March. The winter application for 2021 just opened. It's open for a few months. So if you're interested in go and looking at that, go to ycombinate.com slash apply. The, the time you're at a batch in YC tends to be incredibly intense. Even though I can list on one short page the set of things you do, what we bring, I think, more than anything else is the ability to focus. So we do these things called office hours, again, pretensions to being an educational institution. We meet individually with companies and founders, and we also meet in groups with company and founders. We have dinners once a week where there's a notable speaker, we get together, we're doing it a little differently now during our virtual batch, so we're sort of having virtual dinners, but um, usually past founders and investors come and give a talk that's relevant to, to starting a startup. Most of the time while you're at YC, <clears throat> what all the office hours of any kind are focused on is you're building your business. You're working on either getting product market fit or growing or figuring out what you're going to do. The program culminates in what is sort of historically called a demo day. It's not really a day where you demo your product, you pitch your product. There's, um, there's thousands of investors in a demo day, uh, generally a thousand or so in person, <clears throat> and then a couple thousand or more online. Of course, during these COVID times, everyone is online. The last demo day, I think there were 3,500 investors who came to the online site. <clears throat> and this is all sort of part and parcel of fundraising, which is not the most important thing we do at YC, but it is obviously very important and critical. And if you guys have any questions about fundraising and how it works and what a safe is, how, how people read seed rounds, I'd be happy to talk about those as well as we get to the end. And one of the real, the, we always stayed with our companies from the very beginning throughout their lifetime. PG will still come home and meet with the guys from, from Airbnb. Um, but the relationship really truly does last 
for um, with our with our life to the entire life of the company and beyond. I I frequently do office hours with people who's who have changed companies, who have left their companies, or whose company has failed. Once you're a YC founder, you're a YC founder forever. But we like to say now that our that our that our relationship in 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 more significant ways lasts from the very idea of the company all the way through hopefully their IPO or whatever that last stage is. Part of that is because of the alumni network that um, is, is really relevant. Um, it is true that most startups fail. It is true that eventually most YC startups will fail, but fewer, 70% of all YC startups of those 2,500 startups are still alive. And this alumni network helps in so many ways. They help as, they help as investors, they help as customers, they help as advisors. They're a really important part of what makes my what make, what makes YC YC. Excuse me. We have we built software. We have a, we have an amazing software team, and we have software that connects alumni together. That there's there's um, the software called Bookface, where you can find people. You can there's forums where you can connect with people, and so on. We have a program called Work at a Startup, which helps startups hire their first and um, most important employees. We've created two programs that help companies in the latter stages. One, right after you do your seed round, the next 18 to 36 months, the next round you raise is typically called a Series A. And we have a program to help people create their Series A pitch, create their strategy around Series A, and then, and then connect you with investors, Series A. And for companies that are scaling already, we have a growth program that was started by our continuity group, which has raised funds that actually invests in companies at the growth stage. And some of you may have actually be familiar already with Startup School, which is sort of on the other end where you, there, there's more great content for startups, I think, than anywhere else on the internet and helps companies really get going in the very beginning stages of their life. Oh, have, have any of you guys applied to YC already? Yes or no? A few of you have? So I argue to people that it's helpful to apply regardless of whether you even want to do YC, intend to do YC. Just going through the application will help you <clears throat> with your company. <clears throat> Excuse me. We ask a set of questions that are, are really useful, but it also doesn't cost anything to apply. So if you're wondering whether and when you should apply, when you have an idea, when you're thinking hard about your startup, that's the time to apply. The, um, I mentioned the, app, the winter 2021 application is already over. The deadline is September 23rd, so you still have time. But it doesn't matter if you've applied in the past. It doesn't matter if you've been rejected. Keep on applying. Most of the people who apply to YC have applied before and not gotten in. So, any questions? We have a, a FAQ at, at, on our site, and you can also feel free to email us at apply at ycombinator.com. You do not need to be a registered company to apply. In fact, the, someone just asked that question. In fact, um, we will help you with becoming, we will help you incorporate, and we will help you with all that stuff. Someone asked whether they should wait to be closer to the deadline so that you can make progress. Um, you know, making progress is good. You can always also update your app if you, if you want to. If, even once the app's closed, you can request to update. <clears throat> I, I, I think there's a, um, I, I, the, the main recommendation I'll make is to apply before the deadline. You can actually apply after the deadline, but your odds go down of getting in. So it's better to apply before the deadline. Um, and also, you can fill out the application, not submit it until you're ready. It's up to you. Let me run through a few myths that might be helpful. Um, so you're a solo founder. You don't have any users or revenue, or too many users, or too much revenue. None of these are good reasons not to apply to YC. Um, 
you want your company to be in the best shape it can possibly be, obviously, but it never hurts you to apply. It never hurts you to fill out your application. And if you're a solo founder planning to get another co-founder, you can mention that on your application. If you're planning to stay as a, co a solo founder, which, you know, some people can do. It's super hard. I actually tried to start a company as a solo founder and failed pretty badly. I, I discovered that, that, I am not a solo founder. It is uh, being a, being a founder of any kind is extraordinarily hard, but some people can do it. And some people are actually better at that, but not me. You've been rejected. So um, you're not going to get in ever. Not true. Like I said, most people have, have applied before. The one important thing to keep in mind, if you're going to apply again is what we're looking for is progress. We're looking for some evidence that our rejection was, was was actually wrong venture capitalists of all kind investors of all kind get this wrong all the time it's important to keep in mind to respect the difficulty of making a call based on you know a couple of kids right out of school and an idea it's super hard to to see that future and we try hard and we we're, I, I would claim better at, the, at it than anyone in the industry it doesn't mean it's not still super hard and that we're wrong sometimes. Um, there's this meme that's going around, honestly, that, oh, the batches are too big. It's not as valuable as it used to be. It's way better for small batches. The only thing problem with this, the only <clears throat> thing I would say about this and the only problem with it is, is that it's exactly the opposite of the truth. It's precisely wrong. Big batches are great. They're customers for you. It's a bigger network. There's more amazing founders to learn from and connect with. Um, and we've sharded YC so that companies do get individual time from partners who have amazing pattern matching who have seen thousands of companies. So no, we, we intend for our, to, to fund more companies, not fewer, and that will make our network better. And you know, keep in mind, the reason we do this is to improve your chance of success. The reason we grow the batches is because we think that improves your chances of success. Ours too, but yours as well. I've already raised some money, so I shouldn't apply to YC. You should apply to YC um, because we improve your chance of success. Probably if you've raised a series A, it's, it, it'll be difficult to apply to YC and do YC. There are a few companies who have raised a series A who've still done YC. But the majority of, white, uh, of, of applicants nowadays, and this is a big change, actually have raised some money, whether it's from institutional investors, angel investors, or friends and family. Not a good reason not to apply. And the last thing I'll say is that 7%, YC's deal is $125,000 for 7%. It's just too much equity to give away for your company. And um, I would suggest you read another Paul Graham essay called The Equity Equation. What you have to believe simply mathematically is that YC improves your value by more than 7.5%. Um, the deal actually used to be much worse, much different. It used to be fourteen dollars to $17,000 for sometimes even more than 7%, but certainly 6 or 7%. Um, but it's not about the money. It's not about the equity. It's about improving your chance of success. And there's good reason to believe that we'll do that. We have funded more successful companies than any other organization uh, of any um, that, that uh, is similar in any way. So I will always argue, um, again, depend, as long as you're, you're, you're not like a 50 person company and you've raised a series A, that YC is more likely to help your company than, than any other path. So maybe these aren't such secret advantages to YC, but I'll, I'll bring them up anyway, my opinion anyway, that um, we help you focus. YC companies years later decide to go back on YC time. There's something special about, the, you know, when you do office hours with people who've seen every kind of success and more importantly, failure, and people are, are pushing you and pushing you to get in the right direction. There's something about that focus. There's something about having your batchmates around that are all like working like crazy people to build their dream and to build their business. Something special about that time. And uh, uh, YC partners 
are special and that we've seen so much. We've seen so much failure and success that what we'll always tell you is we will not be the kind of investor who's just building up. We're not here to make you make our founders feel better. We're here to give you the truth. And we'll always give you that harsh light of the truth. Another secret advantage, it has to do with the thing I mentioned about batch size and the alumni network, is that we bring you customers. We're all consumers, so even if you have a consumer product. But YC, you're, you're the, if you look at some of the best YC companies, look at Stripe, for example. Stripe's first 100 customers were YC companies. Patrick Collison used to go around to his batchmates. And if you don't know Stripe, they're, they're one of the biggest payment companies in the world. And Patrick, when he started, would just go sit down next to founders and say, hey, you guys want payments? Or you guys need payments? And if they said yes, he would open up his laptop and in five minutes, they would have payments. And we have other advantages. We have an investor database. Obviously, the brand and the status of doing YC is helpful now. We, we, we're a lot different than we were 15 years ago and people know who we are. And notably, investors, potential employees, et cetera, know who we are. And your batch mates, big batch again is great. These are your superpower. These are people who, who become your friends and your allies as you build your company. All right, so I'm gonna finish up pretty quickly just to talk about yourself. What advice would I give to someone in college who wants to start a company? Simple, few things. I think you should read some of these essays because the, the clarity with which PG has written and the, um, accuracy of what he says about what it takes to start a startup is still true. But find your co-founders, find your co-founders amongst your peers, people you know well, who are, as I said before, compliment you, who are animals, who are going to share your passion and build your business with you. And if you don't have ideas, generate them. And if you have an idea and you think it's your final idea, a lot of you are probably wrong. So generate more ideas or push on your idea, work on it. And more than anything else, don't wait, build things. Build anything you can. If it's hardware, tinker. If it's software, write, write things. You know, prototype. It doesn't have to be the full thing. Build something. Steve Jobs famously wouldn't start any product without a prototype. The first prototype of an iPad was wood. He just wanted to hold it and feel it and see if it felt like he thought it should feel. And the last thing I'll say is pay attention. Just pay attention. Be aware. It's easy to get sort of buried in your schoolwork or in your social life or in what it means to be in college. You guys are better at this by far than back when I was in college, but pay attention to what's going on in the world and it will inform your decisions as you, as you make all these key decisions that will be uh, inevitably important while you're building your company. And just a couple last things. Um, you know, sometimes we talk about the risk of doing a startup. What if it fails? I, I will argue that, you know, the risk of going and spending your best years of your life working on someone else's projects and someone else's dream is a bigger risk. Time is the most valuable resource by far that you'll have in your life. So the biggest risk in life, I think, is, is wasting it. Spend your time with people you like. That's why I say found a company with friends. Um, you're going to spend a lot of time with these people. You're getting married. <laughs> you're going to spend more time than you think. So make sure you enjoy it. And then build things. There's nothing as satisfying in life as building things. And remember, you guys are, many of you are interested in doing a startup. It's pass fail. Almost always it's pass fail. So pass. Make sure you pass. Um, make decisions that make it more likely that you pass. And, you know, uh, the, the guys from Airbnb come back every batch and give a talk. And one of the things Brian Chesky really emphasizes that matters to them so much is they're thinking about what Airbnb is, is, will be in the future, is to be a force for good in the world. It's one of the most positive reasons to take control of your destiny and build a startup is that you can make a difference and be positive in the world. And in fact, when we fund people, we really want to fund people who are going to make the world a better place. Uh, life is too short for all of us to be doing anything but that. So I think we have about 15 or 20 minutes left. I have some stories that I'd be happy to talk about, but I, I, I'm sort of really interested in hearing if you guys have any questions that, um, that I can help you with as you guys start your um, journey. And hopefully I'll see some more of you back at YC someday soon.
Um, hi, I have a question. Go ahead. So uh, my team and I won the Collider Cup for spring 2020. And we are doing our research on different VC and fundraising. And of course, like uh, YC is on our list. <laughs> And so Good. what do you think of Y Combinator helping a startup in food space? Like uh, our project is a vegan-based filet mignon. We have, we have funded a whole bunch of clean food startups already. Um, I personally believe that clean food is gonna take over the world. It, it, for me, it's almost inevitable the, the, the clean meat's gonna take over the world. The, the real, the, the, you know, Anyone who's done any research at all into what the 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 the, the havoc, the disaster that the that the um, the beef the 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 meat industry wreaks on the world, and the sort of the awfulness of of what it means to do industrial uh, farming of of animals. Um, it's you know if I want to believe anything about the human race, it's that will that will 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 do that. And you know the sometimes people um, I, this is probably another myth I should include. People think that YC is just a software that we just fund software companies and sometimes just consumer software companies. Actually, enterprise software companies is our biggest sector now. But <clears throat> we, like I said, we we we're also the largest seed funder of healthcare startups in the world. We, we've funded hundreds. I think it's over 300 now. We have funded nuclear power companies. Uh, we've funded, um, like I mentioned, clean meat, clean, um, clean meat, and other uh, uh, climate change companies. So we're, we're trying to fund uh, everything that we can that, will, that has the potential to change the world in significant ways. And you can find out more about that by going on the YC fight site and looking for uh, requests for startups. That's great. Can't wait to look at the application. Thank you. Yeah, so someone suggested that I go that I stop screen sharing and go back to the gallery view. So maybe I'll do that for everyone. Um, and someone else asked, wait, um, let me stop the screen sharing. Someone else asked. Do you fund companies that potentially compete with the existing portfolio? That's a good question. And the answer is, it's kind of obvious, I would say. It's impossible not to. We have 2,500 companies. They will inevitably compete. We're pretty good at it. Sometimes we have competing companies in the same batch. And it just, it, it doesn't tend to matter. We're very careful about how we do that. We're very early stage investors. We also have, we're, we also have a, a growth fund. We won't fund competing companies with the growth fund. That's way more complicated. We get on boards and things like that. We don't do that. We're early stage. And our, you know, we'll, we are very careful about not sharing any information uh, between companies, and it works fine. Interviews are not exactly done on a rolling basis. They're, I would say they're on a pseudo rolling basis. Most interviews take place all at once within a few weeks, but it's also true that um, I think someday in the future we'll probably look more like a, a, a sort of a rolling interview process. Later in the game, as as, as people apply late and and um, and so on, we'll um, and, you know that's kind of a, a a secret that we don't talk about that much. But you can apply late. You can. How stupid would be be to turn down your amazing company just because you applied late? It's just it lowers your odds, so you shouldn't do it. But we do sometimes take companies that apply late. Um, and those do, it does look more like a more rolling basis. Um, let's see, can we apply now for the next summer term? Yeah, I didn't talk about that. You can't, there, there, is, an, there is an early decision that you can apply for and you can, you can mention that in the application. Um, do I foresee YC batches going remote even after the pandemic? Uh, I, I think there'll be hybrid. There'll be an aspect will be remote. For example, it probably, but we're, we're learning, but it turns out that some aspects of being remote are great and we can actually help our companies more and we can be more in touch with them. Some of that is just using technology in ways that we didn't think we could or wouldn't, didn't really experiment with because we're, you know, like, like any other group running things, we just had a way of doing things. 
but this has forced us to experiment and we're learning a lot. I think companies, for example, that are based in India might not want to spend their whole three months in Mountain View and they'll spend most of their time in India, but they'll still come together because it's super important for us to have that connection. I have a question. Um, I think that's his dog. <laughs> Sorry about that. What was that question? Uh, so I'm working on commercializing a uh, platform technology that we developed in the lab that I'm doing my PhD in. Um, and our first target is around sustainable materials and sustainable plastics. Um, and so we can pursue government funding through like SBIR or, or other government grants. Yeah. Do you think YC and or VC would be worth considering as well in this space? Or is it really worthwhile to just go with the non-dilutive funding at the front end to really develop? Um, I have a really simplistic rule for whether you should raise VC funding and whether and when you should raise VC funding. You should raise VC funding um, when you can, and you should raise it if you can. Um, and if you can't, well, then you, you, you shouldn't you shouldn't bother. It doesn't mean you shouldn't try, but you should, you should figure out whether you can or can't. Um, if you don't want to, if you want to bootstrap your company or you want to do, do non-dilutive funding, you can. Non-dilutive funding doesn't tend to, um, doesn't tend to be in amounts that, that do anything but allow you to get started. So um, look, you can raise venture financing if your company matches sort of the key aspects of what a venture capitalist are looking for. And so they're looking for kind of two things, one that you can grow fast and two that you can grow big. If, if you can be persuasive that your company, your product can do those things, then you're venture financeable. And you wanna be one of a simple rule, another simple rule about whether you might wanna be venture financeable or not, or, or, or raise venture financing or not is, um, how would you feel if a competitor was doing exactly what you're doing, but they raised $10 million or $5 million and you didn't? And if the answer is, oh, that makes me feel really bad, then maybe you ought to be the person who raises that money. Thank you. Sure. Um, yeah. So uh, there's there's the, well, there's a question about what's on my reading list, and uh, I don't know if that'd be that interesting to you. I, I haven't I haven't lately been reading that many books that are um, sort of relevant to startups. I'm trying I'm trying the uh, some of the advice is uh, the, some of the, the the things I'm reading now are more about um, thinking more deeply about questions of 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 consciousness and 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 values. And so I just read Jed McKenna's. Um, spiritual enlightenment, the damnedest thing. And it's gotten me thinking a lot about, about how, how people think about consciousness. And, and I've been listening a lot to a guy named Toby Yord, who's, who um, um, is one of the founders of effective altruism. And he's a, he's a philosopher at, at, um, at Oxford. And he's actually very interested in existential risk. And I'm super interested in existential risk as well. A, a, a book to read about that, a, a, an interesting, book to read on that score is um is um super intelligence um in fact my predecessor sam altman left to go work with open ai because he believed so importantly that he, he believed that the the risk of the potential existential risk of artificial intelligence to uh to humanity is so significant that he needed to spend time on that more than anything else. But I, I wanted to pivot there to the talking about advice, uh, the next question, which is a, a advice about keeping personal values that are resilient through challenges, doubt, and failures. Well, I, I guess that's a matter of priorities. I, you know, um, there's certain things that we'll make compromises on. You have to make compromises on throughout your life and throughout your startup. Certain things you won't. And your personal values, well, you shouldn't because um, they will outlast your startup and your business and everything else in your life. So, so keep true to those. 
Yeah, sorry, uh, I, I should have mentioned the, 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 the author of superintelligence, Nick Bostrom, who is also a, a, an expert on existential risk. Um, uh, Toby Ord, who I mentioned, has a new book out, I think called The Precipice, which is, is uh, um, easier to read. The, the Bostrom, uh, I found a little tough going <laughs> in a lot of places, but um, Toby Ord is, 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 I think, easier to read. Um, yeah, someone asked for my stories, and I fear there's not that much time for my stories. Um, I will tell you, I'll tell two, one of the interesting things is that two of my startups had sort of super um, relevant pivots. And you guys know what a pivot is, right? It's like, you know, it's your idea, and then your idea doesn't quite work out the way you thought it would. Um, one of the, 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 my, not my first startup, but my, one of the early startups that I was in that actually did well was a startup called 411, which um, was 411. You guys even know what that means, 411? Can, can anyone, who knows what, does 411 ring a bell? Yeah, what's 411? Yeah, someone's laughing. So if you're older, you know, yeah, it's information. Um, so yeah, if you're older, you'll know that. But information, like when, when people had like, you know, not access when people didn't have access to the internet and you wanted to find someone's phone number you would dial 411 literally 411 and get information so this first company was called 411 we were a directory we were a directory because people were going to have to find each other on the internet right we were going to help people find each other and this company we we invented we kind of invented facebook before it was facebook it was called connect we invented instant messaging uh, we never really made managed to commercialize any of these things. We were kind of struggling because our directory, like it seemed like it's a pretty good idea, but people used it like once a month and no one cared. And so we were struggling and for a variety of reasons of paying attention to what was going on, we, we, we ended up hitting on email as something that might matter. And we, we, we pivoted from this directory to web-based email. We launched it in, we, we decided to do it in November of 1996. We launched it in February of 1997 and were bought by Yahoo for almost $100 million in October of 1997. That is a successful pivot. Similarly, this company Lala, um, I was the founding investor and became the CEO of this company, but the original idea of Lala, believe it or not, was a CD trading platform. Okay, like raise your hand if you ever listen to CDs now, right? This was this was a platform on a dying medium. We all knew it was dying. It was kind of a stupid idea. I still invested because I believed in the entrepreneur. Um, in the end, we pivoted to sort of a version of Spotify, an online version of Spotify. It wasn't as good as Spotify, but it was just online. And we had this cool idea of a 10 cent song. It seemed cool at the time, but it was really like iTunes in the cloud. It was really cool. It was a great piece of software. And when we pivoted to that, we went through a lot of ups and downs, but in the end, we were purchased by Apple for uh, a really healthy price in um, sort of in the end of 2010. So um, both those companies started with something radically different. So you have to be prepared to change and to, to move and to make sometimes really difficult decisions. Uh -huh. <laughs> This is a good one. What aspects of my personality do you have that enabled your success? Um, you know, uh, it is important to be introspective. I, you know, I, I tend to, I tend to, um, I tend to really be like one of those people who likes getting things done and will like, um, will, I, and I can focus, I can focus so much that it annoys my family so much because people will be talking to me and I won't hear them at all. So I have the ability to focus and get things done. And I don't know, and maybe I've just been, been lucky too. One of them, well, my wife just told this story. Some friends of ours, when our kids were all really young, um, with our kids asked them, what, is, what, is, what does Jeff do? And um, they said something. And then, and then the, the father sort of said, yeah, he really won the jackpot. And, Oh, no, he really won the lottery. And so from then on, their kids thought I had just won the lottery. And that's what was the secret to my success. So, you know, work hard, be smart, and um, be lucky. Those are good things. Itaman, is it okay to go a little over? I don't know if people can stay a little longer.
Yeah, of course. If you are down, it should be totally cool. I think I have a few more minutes. I think it would be really cool if you could uh, talk about one of your crazy founder stories, because at the starting uh, in the chat, people wanted to hear that the most. <laughs> crazy founder stories. Um, so, um, well, the stories run the gamut from um, things that went incredibly well and things that went incredibly badly. Let me give you a couple of stories of uh, crazy founder stories that, that, that are about resilience and finding your path. Um, this, one, this one founder, um, th th this, this one company uh, came to YC and it was a, 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 I won't name any names here, it's kind of a difficult story, a man and a woman who knew each other, who were, who were best friends. And they started a company together and they, they came into YC and in the very first part of YC, one of the founders realized that the other founder just, it wasn't right. It just wasn't working out and they had to split and it was, it was anything but amicable. And the, the second founder, although they were best friends, sued the first founder and Try to actually destroy the company because that's what that's what that is doing. When when you're like the best thing to do if you break up with the founder is just to walk away. There's nothing there, but it didn't matter. It didn't matter. It was personal, and so they sued. And you know, so we had a hard talk with them uh, with the other founder and said, "Look, you can't do YC now. We just can't. It's you're 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 a broken company. Go resolve that and come back." And I never thought I'd see them again. And um, two batches later. The founder had settled the lawsuit, came back, and is a, they're going to be a high-flying YC company now. The, 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 the person came back as a solo founder and has millions of dollars in recurring revenue now and is doing incredible. Um, I, I would not have believed it. The resilience and the, um, and the grit that that demonstrated just shows that that's what you need actually that, that this person showed that they had what it takes to be a solo founder amazing um another story i'll tell is maybe well known but i'll tell it anyway it's uh, a story of brex you guys heard of brex anyone raise your hands i can kind of see you heard of brex so brex is this interesting story of there's two uh, brazilian founders who um started a a, a a, um, a finance company, an electronic finance, an e-finance company in, um, a fintech company, I should say, in Brazil and sold it for a little bit of money when they were in, when they were in high school. And then they realized their dream, which was to go to Stanford. They, they, sorry, not Berkeley, Stanford, but they came to Stanford and realized they were incredibly bored in school and they needed to start a startup. So they decided to start a virtual reality startup because virtual reality was going to be the future and you know it's still going to be the future some someday right and so they came to yc and we thought it was a really bad idea but we loved the founders they were pretty amazing so they dropped out of stanford did yc with the virtual reality startup and they were kind of like a little bit like a third of the way through the batch and they were kind of like not really inspired by their idea and they sort of realized that what they really wanted to do was start another fintech company so in the middle of the batch, they pivoted to this company called Brex, which is basically a credit card for startup companies. And now they're worth something over $2 billion. So, you know, what's the moral of that story? Well, the moral of the first story is being a startup founder takes toughness and resilience. The moral of the second story is follow, your, follow what matters to you. Don't do what seems cool. Don't do what other people think is cool. Don't do what seems prestigious. Do what seems to match who you are. Um, I think I'll do one more question. So it, it almost feels like you think there was a list you shared. Um, and the list you had had fine co-founders before finding the idea. 
do you think that getting the right co-founder is more important than the right idea or that should come first and I ask yeah. because I have an idea I do like but I'm moving ahead without a co-founder saying when I find them it's good but I don't want to stop and wait for that perfect person I actually um, think my list had ideas first and then co-founders second but um, I actually am not religious on that score at all I think some companies you start with your co-founder first and you find an idea that you're both passionate about and both believe in and you go and sometimes someone has an idea and recruits co-founders from that it can go either direction and i i wouldn't i wouldn't worry overly much about the order of operations as far as that goes i think i think um i'm, I'm almost 10 minutes over i i think i'll uh, i'll i'll call it there thank you all for for spending time with me on a um, Tuesday morning. I, um, I hope you all uh, start your startups. I wish you the best of luck. If anyone has any individual questions, feel free to email me directly. You saw there is a, a link for apply at ycombinator.com if you have admission specific questions. If there's anything you think I can particularly help you with, I'm Jeff, spelled G-E-O-F-F -F, at ycombinator.com. Feel free to email me directly. I'll try to be as um, quick as possible with my response. My email is a little a little unfortunate right now, but I'll do my best. Good luck, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, thanks, Jeff, and thanks uh, to everyone, to Tamana and Michelle and Melissa for helping to organize. I'll put Michelle's uh, email in the chat, so if you have any SET questions, uh, please go ahead and uh, email her. And then remember, there's the follow-up office hour events that Tamana mentioned earlier, where you can get um, more attention with your questions for YC. And also, we will be re adding this to the SCET YouTube channel uh, today. So if you want to go back and review any of this, go to the uh, SCET YouTube, and you'll see it there soon. So thank you, everyone. Tamana, anything else to say? You feel free to email me. My email's in the chat. Always happy to chat and answer any questions you guys have. Thanks. Great. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Have a good one.